This video is about inductive reasoning. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the definition of inductive reasoning or logic. You can hear it either way. Inductive reasoning is using past observations or patterns to make a prediction about something that's going to happen soon. As an example of this, we could have a visual pattern where you have a series of symbols and you have to figure out the next symbol in the line. Or you could also have a series of numbers like 1, 3, 5, and then you have to figure out the next one. Another example of when we use inductive logic is when we have a situation and we use our prior knowledge to sort of predict what's about to happen. For instance, if your brother or sister calls you and you look at your cell phone and see who it is, and then you don't answer it because you know, oh, it's my brother, he's just going to ask me for money, you used inductive logic to make that decision. The guess about the pattern or what's next in the series is called a conjecture. A conjecture may or may not be right. So we have to test it to see. Um, for the visual example, this would be the next symbol in the series. And for the numbers 1, 3, 5, the next one would probably be 7. Those are both good conjectures based on the evidence that we have. There's one thing that could prove that we're wrong, and that's a counterexample. Some patterns are ambiguous, so we could make a guess that seems reasonable and seems like it should be right, but then if we find further evidence, it might show that our conjecture wasn't actually correct. So for example, so we have a series 1, 2, 3. So an obvious choice for the next term might be 4, because we're just adding 1 every time, 1, 2, 3, 4. But if I tell you that the next number in the series is 5, so our, our series is 1, 2, 3, 5, well, then we know that we're not just adding one every time, so we have to figure out what is this new pattern. So we think, okay, well maybe we're doing one plus two equals three, two plus three is five, three plus five is eight, so maybe the next number is eight. But then if I tell you, no, the next number in this series is actually seven, we have to think about it again. We have one, two, three, five, seven. So now we go, oh, maybe they're prime numbers, so 11 would be the next number. So we have a lot of different possibilities. In order to prove that our conjecture is wrong, we just need one example of it being wrong, and that would be a counterexample. Another instance of a counterexample would occur in the following situations. Somebody's talking to you and they say, well, the sky is always blue. If you go outside at night, that's not true. The sky isn't blue then. Or if it's cloudy outside, then the sky might not look blue. It might look more gray. Or if you go to Mars, then the sky would be red instead. So we have all of these counterexamples that show the statement the sky is blue is not true all the time. And if it's not true all the time, then we don't consider it a true statement. There's a special kind of statement called an if-then statement that we have, a, we have to have a specific kind of counterexample for. So if it's a cat, then it has fur. That means that to prove that statement wrong, we need something that's a cat but doesn't have fur. So we need one of those little hairless cats like this. So that would be a good counterexample for our statement. Something that would not be a counterexample is like if I showed you a picture of a naked mole rat. It doesn't have hair, but it's not a cat. So that's not a counterexample because we have to have, if it's a cat, that part has to be true and then we're showing that then it has fur is wrong. And we're going to talk more about that later, but that's a basic example of if-then statements. He's okay. My finger is okay too.